Good afternoon, and what a afternoon. This is an exceptionally good afternoon for the Princeton University community, as we have much to celebrate and be grateful for today. My name is Ben Chang, and I'm the Deputy Vice President for Communications here at Princeton University. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to join us in this celebration as we honor Dr. Suki Manabe. Thanks to all of you for joining in this moment, including those watching the live stream across uh, the live stream broadcast across campus and beyond these walls. I would first like to thank the Office of Communications, the entire team that helped put all of this together, along with all the content you may have been seeing today online on our homepage, Princeton.edu, as well as on social media. Our channels today include a history of climate modeling and a link to our digital home to all things related to environmental research here at Princeton. In particular, Dan Day, Becky, Mike Hotchkiss, Denise, Liz Fuller-Wright, Denise, the entire team that has been alongside Dr. Manabe from uh, early morning today uh, and th uh, through the course of uh, the last few hours. Details about this press conference. We'll start with remarks by Debbie Prentice, host of Princeton University, Stefan Fuglestadler, director of our Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences Program and Director of Cooperative Institute for Modeling the Earth System, and Tom Delworth, Senior Scientist at the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory. Just don't be fooled by his Wisconsin Badgers face mask. Where is Tom? There he is. After that, Dr. Manabe will speak, the moment we know everyone is really waiting for. When he concludes, we will open the floor to questions from the media. We will call upon each member of the media, and a runner will bring a reporter a microphone so everyone can hear your question. So please hold your question until you receive the microphone. Beyond the media, uh, I'm happy to say uh, of uh, students, faculty, and staff who are friends and fans of Dr. and members of his family, which, uh, whom we'd like to, to greet uh, and honor as well on this special day. Depending on the number of media questions, uh, we hope to leave some time for uh, audience questions as well. With that, I am pleased to hand the microphone over to the Provost of Princeton University, Debbie Prentice. Thank you, Ben. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you all to this press conference and celebration. This is a very, very special occasion for Dr. Manabe, uh, the laureate, and his family, and his countries. Uh, in this case, both Japan and the United States can beam proudly. Uh, this is also an important 
our community, uh, the students, faculty, and researchers and staff uh, who are proud and grateful to Suki Manabe, a colleague, partner, and friend. So let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Manabe. He is a pioneer in his field and a pioneer for humanity. Um, he was one of the founding scientists of the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory, a national climate research laboratory that, that is a joint endeavor of Princeton University and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. Dr. Manabe created the first global climate model after his groundbreaking studies of atmospheric dynamics in the 1960s. Um, but let's go back to the beginning. So born in 1931 in Ehime Prefecture, Japan, Dr. Manabe received his PhD from the University of Tokyo in 1958. That same year, he came from Japan uh, to the United States, NOAA's predecessor organization, the National Weather Service, where he used physics to model weather systems. In 1963, Dr. Manabe moved from Washington, D.C. to Princeton to help lead GFDL, and in 1968, he became a member of Princeton University's faculty. Dr. Manabe was co-author of a 1967 paper that was the first credible report of climate change and led to the creation of the first three-dimensional model of global warming in 1975. Dr. Manabe identified profound connections between the sea, the land, and the atmosphere. His revolutionary idea, using numerical modeling to predict how the Earth's surface temperatures are influenced by atmospheric conditions, was a major breakthrough, giving researchers a powerful new tool to investigate the Earth's complex climate systems. His work is foundational for all modern climate research, uh, as, as the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences noted in announcing the award today. They said his work laid the foundation for the development of current climate models. Um, and as Gabe Vecchi, uh, who is professor of geosciences and director of the High Meadows Environmental Institute here at Princeton, said, the whole field of climate modeling originates with Suki. The idea that you can take something so complex as the climate system and code the equations that govern it and put them in a computer and use that to simulate the climate system started with him. A and doing so not only illustrated some of the potential consequences of global warming, but gave us a roadmap of how to do climate science. Manabe exemplifies this university's commitment to addressing the world's most pressing challenges, climate change chief among them, through steadfast, incisive, and world-changing research in the nation's service and in the service of humanity. So we are now going to hear from a couple of Dr. Manabe's colleagues. I ask uh, Professor Fugler-Stahler to say a few words. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's absolutely a Immense Suki, to congratulate you for the Nobel Prize in Physics. I think everybody in was like me, absolutely thrilled this morning when we read the news. We usually associate the Nobel Prize in Physics with stellar music and faraway galaxies. Yet, here this prize is devoted to someone who devoted his life to the study of our very home. It's no exaggeration to call Dr. Manabe a giant. In a handful of papers, some 50 years ago, he redefined climate science and laid the ground for modern climate science, a science that is quantitative and that allows predictions. Unfortunately, the world set out to test Dr. Manabe's predictions of to emit carbon dioxide. As you all know, Dr. Manabe's prediction of what will happen proved to be correct and stood the test of time. Dr. Manabe knew what he wanted to achieve, and he knew how to do it. Sometimes it's that simple, in hindsight. Dr. Manabe's work is outstanding also because in the first step, he dramatically idealized and simplified the problem and basically boiled it down to its very essence, namely a single atmospheric column. His work was the first to show 
that when done correctly, this gives us the backbone of the system and predicts its temperature and rainfall remarkably accurately. Among his first experiments was the doubling of carbon dioxide. Known at the time that carbon dioxide may affect climate, but his was the first reliable calculation. And most importantly, he recognized the paramount importance of the water vapor feedback, which gives you double the temperature increase from the carbon dioxide alone. So the problem is much worse than what you think if you only look at carbon dioxide. He then went on studying the system with three-dimensional climate models. Initially, just the atmosphere, then together with Kirk Bryan, he added the ocean, then ice, and in doing so, basically created the blueprint for every single climate model that is in use today. Roughly 25 years ago, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was actually awarded to Mario Molina, Sherry Rowland, and Trutzen for their work on, um, regarding the ozone hole. Their work also paved the way for eventual <clears throat> political action, and the world avoided um, a UV catastrophe. Today, Dr. Manabi receives the Nobel Prize for his groundbreaking research, leading to our understanding of the enormous consequences if we continue to increase carbon dioxide. Dr. Manabi's work touches, however, not a problem related to coolants, but, in fact, the very essence or the very reason that we are in this comfortable world we got used to. So the challenge to address is orders of magnitude larger. Dr. Manabi is a wonderful example how essentially blue sky research decades ago can provide the foundation for understanding solving existential problems. On behalf of GFDL Director Ramaswamy, GFDL Deputy Director Whit Anderson, all the staff at GFDL, all of Suki's colleagues across NOAA, I want to convey how delighted we are this richly deserved award that you received today. This is Tom Delworth, the senior scientist at Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory at GFDL, and where Suki worked for many years. I had the great pleasure and honor of having Suki as my boss for the first 13 years of my career, and that was an amazing experience to every single day. From my perspective, Suki is one of the true founders of the field of climate science and climate modeling, a topic that is of such profound importance now to society. When Suki started his career in the 1950s, the topic of global warming was, was quite obscure, but his inspired vision led him to make the fundamental decision which all of modern climate science rests his papers from the 1960s were so visionary and prescient, and I still teach them here in my class later this afternoon at Princeton, you'll see. The, what you learned from the, those papers in the 60s stands the test of time. Many of the climate predictions from the earliest models still hold on, still hold up well today. I have many images of, of Suki over the years from his afternoon jogs around the Princeton Forest Hill campus to expounding on the wisdom of the Princeton basketball coach at the time, Pete Carrill. The reason I think he liked him was that Coach Carrill boiled down the game of basketball to its very, essence, very simplicity of basketball, and he met with amazing success. I think that was Suki's philosophy in boiling down climate science to its very essence and, of course, has met with great success. But one of the real images that sticks to me is in every seminar I would go to at GFDL. Suki was there in the front row on the right side. He was amazingly engaged with every single speaker who came through. His curiosity and his quest for understanding the climate system was insatiable. It was an amazing sight to see. He always was boiling things down. Whatever the topic was, 
down to its essence. That insatiable curiosity, sense of wonder, all with the ability to boil down any topic into its essence, and incredible persistence and hard work, those are some of Suki's characteristics that have guided him over the years. I know that I can speak for my colleagues who have been benefited so much over the years from Suki's vision and enthusiasm. He's been an inspiring and enthusiastic mentor over the years. He had a great ability to help people to grow into their own independent scientists. We're all so delighted at this pioneering and visionary career. I'd like to close with an analogy, so please hang with me. You've probably all heard of Michael Jordan, the basketball player. I've always viewed Suki as a Michael Jordan of climate. <laughs> Michael Jordan came from an outstanding university, North Carolina, great basketball players, went into the NBA and was the world's best player. Suki, from a premier institution at the University of Tokyo, came to the US and became the premier climate scientist in the world, one of them at least. I'd like to say that beyond what, say, Michael Jordan accomplished on his own, he elevated the entire NBA to iconic status, not just in the US, but around the world. So too Suki, in his presence, elevates the entire field of climate scientists to its standing field of such vital and outstanding importance. So I, I view Suki as the Michael Jordan. So to Suki and Noko, we're all just so very happy at this incredibly richly deserved award that I was just delighted to wake up to find this morning, and I can't think of anyone who is more deserving of this award. Congratulations, Suki. Dr. Manabe. Over to you. And you can take your, your mask off if you want. Okay. Okay. I can take you. As I get older, both my Japanese and English are deteriorating steadily. So please forgive me. Uh, the, uh, my uh, broken English here. Uh, it is uh, great as I used to say, surprise, and uh, to be chosen by the Royal Swedish Academy of Science, Nobel Prize established through the generosity and far-sightedness of Mr. Nobel. On this occasion, I would like to thank Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory of NOAA and Princeton University, where I have enjoyed exploring climate change of not only industrial present, but also uh, geological past during last several centuries. I have had a really great time. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Manabe. Uh, we can now turn to questions from the floor. Um, as uh, uh, reporters, uh, get their questions in mind, and as our moderator gets in place, I can kick us off with one, if that's all right, Dr. Manabe, from the Associated Press. I'm going to do my best to channel Seth Brownstein and his team, sorry, Seth Borenstein and his team from the Associated Press. So I will say, you moved to Princeton from Washington, D.C., uh, something I did about three years ago. Uh, I, I'm not in the running for a Nobel Prize. Uh, at this stage. Uh, but Washington, I was hoping to ask if you could speak for a moment about the intersection of politics and climate change 
and what we see as climate denialism mm -hmm. in certain quarters. That's a very good question. Uh, to, to try to understand change, or no, it's not easy, but much, much easier than what is happening in the current politics. <laughs> it's so mysterious, I can appreciate. So that uh, I to predict or understanding climate change is difficult, but nothing is more difficult than what happens uh, in politics, but in society. This now involves not only a, uh, the, uh, uh, our environment, but on also it involves energy, agriculture, water, and just everything you can imagine. And when these major problems of society uh, is all interwoven each other, you can understand how difficult it is to sort this thing out. Uh, and, uh, and also we have to think about how to mitigate climate change is one thing, but we have to figure out how to adapt to climate change, which is happening right now, like drought and uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, all sorts of things. And we are faced on a very difficult problem. And so, uh, some people say if we really have a right prediction in climate change, the problem is solved. But it's far, far from it. So, uh, and, and, and this is, we are now facing very difficult problem. And I honestly say, what is the best action we should take? Myself. I just punt this thing. Thank you. Thank you. I have a feeling we could have an entire conversation about this intersection of issues <laughs> that you just noted. Uh, but we will turn to questions from the floor. And I'm looking towards uh, our colleague Mike Hoskins to call on the first. So please raise your hand if you have a question for Dr. Manabe. Hello, sir, and congratulations. Um, your co-winner, uh, Klaus Hasselmann, said while winning a Nobel Physics Prize is an honor, he would much rather have no warming and no global prize because climate change is so dangerous. Do you feel the same way? And um, non-scientists who deny climate change often accuse scientists of being alarmists. Um, could you possibly say if you wish the models were wrong for the world, but know all too well that they aren't? And tell us a bit about this conflicted feeling of knowing you are right, but wishing it wasn't so. Uh, I didn't quite understand it. Could you repeat the last half of what, final question? Why don't, I, why don't I take a shot at, at that, just for the sake. Yeah. The, the first Dr. Manabe, was you shared the 2007 Nobel Prize for Peace with the UN PCC, would you say that today's recognition is uh, more important to you personally or, or less? How would you compare this to the 2007 IPCC recognition? Yeah, uh, that you are talking about um, uh, IPCC Peace Prize, That's right. which uh, Al Gore and IPCC uh, uh, so, so received. And I'm a, one of the several thousand people of IPCC. 
uh, which uh, uh, received this prize. So um, I, I think that this is uh, uh, I, uh, but now looking back, that's uh, IPCC uh, uh, the uh, Nobel Peace Prize awarded uh, this award to uh, Al Gore and IPCC. You wonder why, uh, what IPCC has anything, climate change, anything to do with this uh, peace. And, uh, but I look back and think, and you can now see uh, climate change, uh, the drought in the Sahel. Uh, creates major problem in agriculture and massive number, there are many reasons, but one of the important reasons is that climate is make it so difficult to live over there and which result in mass immigration from Africa to Europe. And so I think is uh, uh, Nobel Peace Prize Committee has a very excellent idea to awarding this. And although I'm one of the several thousand members, but that's what I think. Thank you. Uh, uh, insightful and elegant answer uh, to, to, uh, to yeah. the Academy. Thank you for that. Okay, uh, let's uh, have another question from the floor. Um, And if you would please identify yourself when you ask. Them. Thank you. Sure thing. Thank you very much. My name is Hank Flynn. I'm a reporter for Fox 29 in Philadelphia. And Professor, you and certainly the colleagues as well, the impression one gets is that this is more Nobel's acknowledgement, less Professor's most recent accomplishment and more of a, a, a lifetime of a like your feeling on that. He had expressed some surprise at being acknowledged by Nobel. Why, when so many of you have talked about the groundbreaking work that the man's done for decades, why is it a surprise? Why would you him for, for his work now? Uh, could you repeat the two why question again? Uh, sure, Professor. You, you'd express some surprise that Nobel had acknowledged your work when you have been doing this, according to all of your colleagues, for decades. Why have they acknowledged your work now? Why now, do you suppose? I see now. Uh, the, uh, I, uh, uh, recently, I look at a list of uh, uh, Nobel Prize winner. And, gosh, they are almost truly outstanding contribution, so far as I understand it. It's a very uh, rigorous in their selection of these award winner. And then, I think about my own work. My golly, I'm going to compare with these work. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so, I just thought, my God, this is, uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, it's a big surprise. I got <laughs> uh, this award. That's what I feel. And but on the other hand, now consider the uh, world crisis, which climate which also involve uh, COVID vaccine. And those are the major crises in humanity. And so I thought that uh, maybe uh, I could, my contribution could be regarded as the direction to at least try to understand better what our problem is. And 
That reason, then I thought maybe it's okay. But, uh, yeah, but uh, that's what I, my feeling of it is. I, I think many in the audience would say it's very okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, another question from the floor. Uh, where is Mike? There's a couple down here, Mike. Hello, uh, my name is Yumiko Oshima from the Nikkei. Uh, I have a question about, uh, did you expect climate change would be such a serious topic and problem in the world when you started your research in 1960s? Yeah, uh, could you repeat the question I again? I'll repeat it. I'll repeat it. Yeah? Did you think that climate change would be such a big problem when you started your research in the 1960s? Oh, yeah, that is easy to answer. And I never imagined that this uh, thing I'm, I would begin to study has such a huge consequences. And uh, I was doing it just because of my curiosity. And uh, I think many big discoveries which had a big impact later in, on society, when it first started, People will never realize how important their contribution is. And if you think about your own research, uh, the, uh, I think most interesting research is driven from curiosity-driven research. Research because because it's societal importance. And uh, so, and I said that, you know, I really enjoyed uh, studying climate change. And just curiosity is a thing which drives all my research. And uh, uh, so I really have a great fun to use climate model as virtual laboratory of climate change. Once you make sure climate is simulating certain feature you want to study, then you do what you call uh, uh, virtual laboratory. That is, couple, virtual climate is uh, um, virtual uh, 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 laboratory of this planet, coupled ocean, atmosphere, and land surface. And it's very difficult to sort out what's going on. And the best way I did was we create, carry out many numerical experiments, changing one thing at a time. And the same, just like chemistry, chemist, laboratory experiment. And uh, the, uh, uh, I really recommend, you know, it's not only modern climate, climate of a geological fast. You know, you look back and time when dinosaur was roaming around on this planet, and then come to all the way to ice age. And now we are facing major crisis, uh, which called global warming. And it is a great fun to use your model to study how climate change over the last 400 million years has evolved. And do all kinds of 
experiment you like. It's fun. So I really recommend that the, the young people use climate model, such as one uh, I had, a couple of ocean atmosphere, but be, very simple parameterization, grid scale process, and so that it's, it doesn't cost much computer time. You carry out countless number of experiments using climate model. Have a great time. I think that this is one thing I would like to recommend. Uh, graduate students of geoscience. And it's a great fun. And then you have a climate change of industrial present and geo. And then you look back, Fanerozoic, all the way towards the future. Isn't that fun? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have called this a press conference. I think it really is a masterclass in curiosity-driven research, Dr. Manabe. Uh, but back to the press conference. Uh, there is another hand in the front row here. Uh, hello. Um, my name is Iko with Fuji Television of Japan. Um, my question on a side, um, and I would like to ask a question in Japanese if that is possible later on, but my question is about Nobuko-san, um, your wife. Um, we've heard that she has supported you a lot, a lot, and she is a very good cook. Could you tell us how she supported you um, while you were doing your research? Nihongo demo. Nobuko san, hijo ni sasae rare tato, yu koto desu kere demo, dono yo ni, toka, mo taihen jose dato, mas, dono yo na oriori ga oski de, iru no ka, choto, I have been enjoying her cooking <laughs> every day. And sometimes she cooks Chinese food, sometimes she cooks Japanese food, and sometimes she cooks Italian food. And I'm the most blessed person in terms of eating all this wonderful food she cook. And uh, she took of my children very well and I never have to worry about them. And they decide what they want to do and then go through. I think they are also enjoying their life very much. And which is attributable to her very successful raising children. And, and so uh, I am just able to focus on my research. Uh, I'm, uh, 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 for example, uh, actually I uh, have uh, very bad driving. And, <laughs> And suddenly, if I th start thinking about something, then I'm not paying any attention to traffic signal. <laughs> and she's she's great driver. My <laughs> so this means I can focus my attention to my research 100%. And on this occasion, I would like to thank her very much for what she has done. Thank you. We were, we were able to do an instantaneous fact check, and looking at the family, there were nods of the head, especially around the driving ability. So yes, that we can confirm. Thank you, and thank you to your family as well. Another question. 
Congratulations. My name is Gakushi Fujiwala from the Asahi Shimbun Japanese newspaper. My question is a little bit more serious. Uh, in Japan, brain is currently a major problem. You mentioned earlier at home the U.S. government has given you a lot of support. What are your thoughts on how to improve the environment of universities and research? in Japan. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Saigo, final sentence. Could you repeat again? How would you recommend improving the university and research uh, system or ecosystem in Japan? Yeah, that's a profound question. And also, I'm not much of an educator, but uh, I think I thought that um, uh, recently uh, Japanese research uh, I, I think they are less and less curiosity driven research than before and uh, I really hope that you would think how to improve Japanese education now. And I think the way a scientist or something advise decision maker in Japan, this channel between scientists and policy makers, Communicating with each other, and uh, I think uh, U.S. is doing much better with the National Academy of Science, which is advising government very effectively. And I think that they they should think about more how the decision makers, scientists communicate with each other. That's what I think. Yeah. Strengthening the connections between policymakers and research scientists it sounds like a strong uh, component for, for any government, for any mm -hmm. country. Another question from the floor. I did see... Yes, actually, uh, indeed, uh, if you're a member of the press or simply a member of our community, please, uh, we have questions. Hi, Suki. It's yeah. there you go. Yes. Hi, Suki. It's Danny Sigmund. Um, and I want to ask you what scientific question you're excited about, thinking about right now. Scientific question are you thinking about right now? What's the most fun scientific question that you're thinking about right now? Yeah. What, is, what is the science, most interesting scientific question you are thinking about right now? Right now. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, in, in a sense, I uh, responded to that area, the, the question already, but what I think is what I'm interested most is a paleo climate, how they evolve, and uh, sort of retired from research, I started looking at how uh, various uh, living things evolve as climate change, and how that living things interact back to climate change. Interaction is so fascinating. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's my answer. And uh, that's what I am enjoying myself. Uh, the, um, I started studying more than 400 million years and that, uh, uh, sort of reading a book on the um, uh, past billion years or two billion years and, and 
begin to realize, though, these molecular biology, which control this plankton, is not easy to understand. Particularly, uh, this how they interact, evolution, and, and so uh, uh, it's a very different molecular biology of the early tons, but without them, I don't think I understand it very well. And it's not easy how RNA, DNA, and all that can go, go, go back. And that just, I'm having extremely difficult understanding it. But that Curiosity never ends for any of us. Uh, another question from the floor. Uh, where is, uh, uh, they're there, all right. Hi, um, Eleanor Sands with AFP. I'm in the back behind the, the cameras. Uh, congratulations. Uh, I wanted to ask you, looking back at uh, your long career and how far climate, climate science has come, what are your uh, thoughts on the enduring appeal of climate uh, skepticism? And also, are you optimistic or pessim pessimistic about the future of the planet? Yeah, that's the uh, future of climate. It's a very interesting question. And uh, sort of uh, solar insulation, how they change and influenced by open parameter. And then uh, sort of, uh, uh, then you kind of extrapolate into the future, because you give the solar insulation, solar spatial variation of insulation associated with the orbital variation. And one thing you first do is, if you didn't do any of global warming, you see now already carbon dioxide increased by uh, 45 percent by human race. But if we, so um, the, my most interesting question is, if you do it, keep changing orbital parameter variation and go to future, without changing in carbon dioxide. And then you put the carbon dioxide in. And then uh, you ask yourself, what happened to the continent? And this is the key question we have to solve right now. Because people talk about uh, 100, 200 years from now, but in after a few hundred years, uh, Greenland ice sheet faces a major danger. And uh, think so that you can experiment with and without. But the CO2 itself is affected by climate. Because climate determines how much you to come from atmosphere to ocean. Ocean is a fascinating thing, storing climate for a very long period of time. And so, uh, I think this is, a, I talked about climate, but I thought that this is another fascinating problem. How our climate is going to change to 10 million years. Uh, you don't have to be 10 years. Maybe you would like to know. So, but that involves, you have to understand dynamics and the summer dynamics of ice sheet. And very, very crude. And so, I think this is Probably, in addition to climate change of past 100 years, but next, uh, you don't know what is going to happen in the next million years. But again, it's very difficult to predict what a human is going to do. 
But uh, this is, I think, a fascinating question. Yeah. Thank you. The next question here. Thank you. Uh, I'm Genji Yamaguchi from Kyoto News Japan. Um, can you tell me what main reason for you to change your nationality from Japan to United States? Why did you change your nationality? The that interesting question. In Japan, people all worry about to disturb each other. You no, know, and they have a very harmonious relationship, and this is one of the important reason why. Get, people get along so well with each other. You know, they, they keep thinking about other people and don't do something which disturb other people. And uh, the, in the U.S., so in Japan, if you ask some question, you get yes or no. However, when the Japanese say yes, it does not necessarily mean yes. It could be no. <laughs> and uh, because they don't want to have the feeling much more than anything else. And so you don't want to do anything which is disturbing to other people. Right? And U.S., I can... I can do things I want to do. I don't worry about too much about, uh, what other people feel, because as a matter of fact, uh, I don't want to uh, hurt other people's feelings, but I'm not observing enough of other people to figure out what I, they uh, and. I found you living in the U.S. is wonderful. <laughs> and probably uh, um, uh, research scientists like me, I can do whatever I please in my research. My boss was generous enough to let me do anything I like to do. And he, as a matter of he got all computer expenditure. I never wrote a single in my life. So I got all the computer I want to use and do whatever I please. So that is one reason why I don't want to go back to Japan because I'm not capable of living harmoniously. <laughs> there are some feelings that I need to look out for. Folks in the top who have a question, and I don't want them to feel left out, so. Hello, uh, my name is Charlie Moulterer, and I'm a first year student here at Princeton University, and I'm sitting up here with my class, which is entirely focused on climate change. So we were wondering if you had any advice for members of our generation in regard to climate change. Do you have any advice for members of the younger generation, first year students? Yeah, uh, the, I think that is the most important in graduate school, to find out what you are good at and what you are not good at. And I literally look at a different profession and I found out if I do any of these professions, I'm not good enough. Only I pro chose a profession which I, I can do, which is very few. So it's very lucky I choose. Uh, uh, but uh, again, graduate season, I recommend curiosity-driven research. 
And I, I think, me, that's the most important advice I give, and which you are good at it. Not because that project is attractive to other people who can do it, but, but because you project, because you are good at it. And I have a difficult time finding out what I'm, I was good at. Wonderful. Thank you for the question. I think we have time for one more. And let, let's make sure it's someone who hasn't already uh, Perhaps down here. Hello, um, my name is Jacinta Clay. I'm one of the graduate students in the Atmospheric and Ocean Sciences program, like many people here. I wanted to know, um, do you believe the work of the GL or climate science is benefited by a diverse and international team of researchers? Climate science, more generally, is benefited by having diverse people, a diverse team of people from internationally and generally diverse, whether that helps. Yeah. I think the co collaboration between GFDO and Prince is, I think, is very important. Uh, uh, yeah. So that, that uh, the great thing they But you know, sometimes it's not easy to collaborate, too. And so, how do we do effective collaboration? And it's important to collaborate, but e easy to find out how you collaborate. And I think that is one of the questions they have to ask themselves. How they collaborate in order to be fruitful? which is not easy to do. Thank you. Uh, do we have, I will amend my previous comment, one last burning question for the... Hi, Suki, this is uh, George Verlander. Uh, I, I wanted to uh, respond to your uh, please. Uh, do science for the sake of curiosity, uh, because at the moment we're in bad shape uh, internationally. Uh, we've lost the confidence of the layman, and uh, somebody commented how astronomers succeed in getting people interested in the black hole and all sorts of things that have little relevance to our lives, and we simply cannot get interested in global warming. Many don't accept it, and it seems to me that one problem is we're not following your advice in doing science for fun. Whenever we talk about global warming, we have pictures of gloom and doom, the end is in sight, it's all over. And you asked about communication between scientists and government, and as far as I can tell, it's mostly advice uh, of, from scientists to the government and from scientists to everybody else. And it seems to me nobody likes to be told what to do. Uh, I'm from Africa, and in my opinion, the big problem in Africa is the excess and the paucity of opportunities. And the way to come is, is to get people interested in the science. And so it seems to me, instead of depending on the to instill a concern about global warming, we should have people take care of global warming because of a love for the And you can only love what you know. And for that purpose, everybody should be taking Danny Siemens course, <laughs> who tells us how the planet works, why this is the only thing know of. Uh, I'm, I'm quite puzzled. Uh, people interested in Mars, people even sign up to go to Mars, which is as interesting as the boring parts of Arizona. And uh, if it's a failure on the part of the scientists that we get the public interested in our own planet. And I think the main problem is the message of gloom and doom. 
And we have to change that. We have to point out to them that we have the means to take care of global but we need the consent of everyone. And to get that consent, everybody should have a basic knowledge <clears throat> of how the planet works. So I, I greatly admire the medical profession. Everybody knows how the human body works. We have problems with vaccinations. So we should not be surprised at this poor state of affairs in communicating climate science at the moment focused on gloom and doom and on giving advice. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Manabe, I, I, I would give you the microphone if you have any last uh, yeah. comments for us before we conclude. <laughs> 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 the hand. Um, couple last uh, points. One is I would like to acknowledge uh, of the many um, members of the Princeton University community. Uh, the chair of our department, Dr. Anand Verlind, is here. Thank you uh, for your presence. Um, this and several other Nobel laureates, and several laureates whom we're uh, going to uh, toast together um, at a reception just outside after this event. So please do join us. Uh, I'm looking up uh, first-year students as well uh, for that very special moment for our Princeton University community. Uh, this is not a uh, uh, for those who can see the stage. Uh, it happens to be, though, a copy of Beyond Global, uh, published by none other than the Princeton University Press. Um, uh, so I wanted to explain why it was uh, sitting here. Um, and lastly, thank you uh, for all of your questions and reflections. Uh, 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 I want to thank you, sir, for your comments and for work and your lifetime of work and the support of your family who was here. Uh, we talked about surprise. We talked about curiosity-driven research. I think in other, in other ways we talk about it as basic research, fundamental research, the kind of research that Princeton is built on um, and how curiosity uh, should never end. So thank you for those words.